Hey Fabricators, and welcome back to another episode of Advancing Fabric, brought to you by Advancing Analytics, your lake house experts. I'm joined once again by my co-fabricator, Johnny. Hey Fabricators. Hey, so we are a little late with the news this month. Um, yeah, Very busy. <laughs> pushing on mid-August. Um, there's been a lot of interesting things though, so I've been dying to talk about this and we'll probably get a couple of these features out in shorts as well, just to kind of dive into a little bit more of the detail and give you snippets of the news. But why don't we dive right in and take a look at what's new this month or this month. Cool. So uh, yeah, as Craig's already alluded to, uh, this dropped the back end of July, we're now mid-August, but uh, we are where we are. Uh, so, just looking through, a brief mention here, of course, the European Fabric Community Conference, uh, which is creeping up on us fast. Craig, you're going to be there, aren't you? I am, yeah. Yeah, that was at one point a couple of months away, and it's now like less than six weeks. Um, I am talking at the conference. I'll be talking about external data sharing, uh, showing my age a little bit by saying, uh, I think the title of the talk something along the lines of data sharing without the USB sticks. Um, or in my case, would have been floppy drives. But anyway, um, yeah, so we'll talk about external data sharing and I'll touch on things like um, delta sharing and the capabilities within Fabric as well and all of those interesting things. So I'm very excited about that. Um, if you're in Stockholm, don't miss out. Go and see Craig talk about data sharing 100%. Yeah. Um, in terms of this week's features, this week, this month's features, uh, I guess... Um, First one that sort of popped out for me, Power BI fanboy as always. <laughs> um, but we've been uh, talking about the fact that the um, the DAX query view, so this um, kind of DAX querying view that's been built into Power BI desktop is now also available uh, in the service, which is uh, pretty awesome. Uh, you can now use it with um, live connect reports as well as um, like being like directly connected to the uh, data set itself mm -hmm. uh, and also this idea with that dix query view where you could write a measure add it to your model you can now actually update multiple measures at the same time which is pretty cool so a uh, big fan of that as a nice sort of quality of life little improvement um mm -hmm. some news here around paginated reports so like i'm a bit of a paginated report nerd i kind of grew up on uh, SQL Server reporting services. So whenever paginated reports get a, a little bit of love, uh, it's always nice to see that. So uh, this idea that you can now bind your paginated reports to um, gateways um, with the API, and also that the uh, editing experience, things like just adding um, parameters and headers and footers and things like that um, inside of your paginated reports can now be done in the service as opposed to in the offline editor, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, okay, so... What's catching your eye, Craig? Yeah, so a couple of things I wanted to kind of call out um, are important developments. I know, I know, networking isn't the most exciting, but we have a few things in the core area. So talking about general availability of Fabric Private Link, of the managed private endpoints, and also the trusted workspace access. So that's starting to give us more of that capability for uh, you to tie Fabric into your own existing platform um, and your own existing data architecture that might be wrapped in virtual networks. You could have those kind of networking restrictions in there and we can start to secure fabric against that so that we're not going out over the, the kind of wider internet. So there's a lot to read in each of those kind of uh, elements and a lot of kind of nuances uh, to those updates. One of the most important parts that I was uh, super excited about is we no longer have that F64 paywall. So during preview, you could only use uh, these elements if you had an F64 or above, and that has now been removed. So you can use the uh, networking components whether you have any fabric capacity. You do still need to have a fabric capacity for it, but it can be any level, which is great to see. Yeah, fantastic news. It kind of feels like they've really listened to the community on that one. Like I know people would, yeah. you know, screaming out for these features in the first instance, and when then when they finally dropped, it was like, yeah, you've got them. But it's F64 and above. Um, <laughs> yeah, one of the other caveats as well to keep in mind and 100% go and read the full documentation because there's a few kind of restrictions and things that apply. But one of the most important ones is that if you enable managed private endpoints, even if you've not set any of them up initially, um, you're going to be restricted to not being able to use the starter pools in Spark. 
because that's essentially warmed up clusters that are hosted by Microsoft in a kind of shared uh, area. So once you set up those, uh, the capability to do private, man uh, sorry, managed private endpoints, you can no longer use that starter pool. You're using custom pools and you're going to have to have that wait uh, to the startup time. So Which something to bear in mind, but yeah. not always something that people can kind of work around. If you need to implement those managed private endpoints, that's not going to be swaying your decision one way or the other. Yeah, security first, definitely. Though mm. that, like the fast start of the clusters was always like a, a nice thing. So yeah, yeah. Listen, that's yeah. a bit annoying, but we are where we are. The price you pay for security. Um, <laughs> Yeah, cool. So I was uh, interested by like literally the next couple of uh, features down. Yeah, um, yeah, me too. The ICD and Git integration type stuff. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go old school. I'm gonna go with a bit of a demo at this point. I think. So uh, set myself up a a workspace here, just to uh, quickly show in those workspace settings that we have now got Git integration with GitHub. Which is great because GitHub is basically just the hipster version of Azure DevOps. Um, so designed for people with um, big beards that drink craft beer and things like that. So uh, I'm a GitHub fan as well. Um, but yeah, one of the other cool uh, new things is this idea of um, workspace branch out, which I think they announced at Fabcom back in Las Vegas, and that's now landed in the most yeah. recent. Um, so that basically, when you have a um, a Git integrated workspace. And you want to create a branch from that workspace like there's there's the opportunity for developers to kind of like trip over each other in terms of which yeah. branch of the repository workspace was synced to at any given point in time uh branch out is really cool so you've got this very little um like somewhat subtle uh, little icon here in the top right um which is shown uh, that's the lineage view that's not the thing at all start again zoom out where am I trying to go? Source control, here we go. So the lineage view and the branching icons are similar. So please forgive me. Uh, but yeah, literally, if I go to my branches now, uh, I get this option from the current branch to branch out to a new workspace. Uh, and this is a pretty neat feature. So uh, what I can do here is when I create a branch, we always initial our branches so that we know who's working on them, which I think is a good practice to do. Uh, if I create a branch here, um, what it'll actually do is I can create a um, a workspace that clones everything that was in there, which I think is pretty awesome. So literally, as we watch this, um, we have got now a brand new workspace up here. Uh, you'll see as it's syncing that my artifacts that are in the yet previous yeah. uh, workspace start to land as well, which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah. I can, for argument's sake, where am I going to go? So I'm going to really impress everybody with my like super fly data science skills <laughs> uh, by adding a brand new um, notebook. Uh, let's stick some, oh, some mark down here. So yeah, that's giving you the capability to work more independently. It's probably especially important when you've got larger teams and you've got multiple developers that are maybe working on different features and things. The risk of just stepping on each other's toes just starts to kind of fade away as well, doesn't it? Yeah, totally. So, I mean, like, I guess traditionally from a Git perspective, you'd have that remote version of the code in your central repository. But I was always used to drawing that down to my local development environment. Yeah. So this is, even though it's still all cloud-based, is effectively sort of replicating, um, replicating that. So I've added a new workbook. I can go to my source control. I can uh, commit my new notebook to my repo with an optional commit message. Best practice, kids, is to <laughs> fill out that commit message. Don't do what I'm doing. I'm I, was, being lazy. I was just about to pull you up on that. That was that <laughs> your comment. I mean, this is not. This is definitely not uh, going to be a lesson in good Git practices, without a doubt. <laughs> uh, if I go to my source control panel here as well, uh, from here I can actually. Uh, link through to my repository. So you'll see here, here I am in uh, in GitHub. Uh, I've got my commit there that I've pushed 20 seconds ago. Do I want to do a pull request? Yes, I do. Um, again, this is going to be criminal Git practices because I should have really set up my repo to not allow myself to approve my own, brand, uh, my own branches, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so if I create that PR, it's going to uh, check if it wants to merge. Yeah, I want to merge, confirm the merge. And now, having done that work, I can uh, delete my branch. If I uh, go back to Power BI, 
Um, Does that delete the workspace, though? It does not delete the workspace, which is very annoying. Yeah. Um, it deletes the branch, doesn't delete the workspace. So I have to go back here. Uh, going back to my workspace, uh, what I should see now is my source control is telling me, oh, hang on a minute, your main branch is uh, got an update pending. And if I basically sync my workspace back to my main branch, my super duper magical notebook should automatically appear. There we go. So, mil yeah, million miles an hour demonstration of how that works. Terrible Git practices, but uh, with the right practices wrapped around that, um, you know, the functionality is now there. And I think that uh, Git branching is a really cool idea. So yeah, so you've got that capability, but would you expect the 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 workspace to be removed as well? Like you can imagine, with maybe slightly poorer practices, you can start to have a lot of workspaces left over from abandoned branches. Because if we've got that direct connection between branch and this workspace is being created for this, if I delete the branch, you would expect that workspace to go as well and just tidy things up. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, yeah. if that if it were, yeah, ideal path. Delete the branch; it deletes the workspace. Currently, they're two separate things. I think if you do delete the branch, then basically when you go into the workspace, you're going to get a load of errors. To sort of say, hang on, the branch I'm associated to doesn't exist. So you're going to get out, out of kills from both sides of the fence. That might lead to people working on artifacts that are basically um, orphaned because they're not actually belonging ah, to a branch yes. anymore and you're going to potentially like lose work and things from that perspective. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you could get into the realms of, you know, having either a, a, in a DevOps pipeline or a GitHub action, you could potentially call the API and the API could go off and uh, delete the workspace for you. But that would be a lot of uh, development and work around just to do that feature. I think if you could link yeah. them a little bit more and make those um, those workspaces a bit more ephemeral. I think that would be uh, loads, loads better. I think the other thing I'd probably want to see as well, which I've not tested, but I'd be interested to do, is sometimes people lock down workspace creation because you don't want workspace mm -hmm. sprawl yeah. and, and how that particular feature interacts with that, um, yeah, that's um, like locking down of workspace creation would be an interesting one. Um, the other shout as well for me, Great to see GitHub in there as a Git provider now. Um, GitHub are owned by Microsoft. Obviously, Azure DevOps is owned by Microsoft. They are still not the only two Git providers in the world. So I've worked with clients in the past that use GitLab, worked with clients that use Bitbucket. Um, those, you know, Git is pretty universal and integrate with, integrates with pretty much anything. Uh, it'd be good to maybe see them expand those uh, integrations yeah. further as well. You're not just locked down to those particular. Uh, those I mean, particular yeah, I mean, if, if we think about the kind of support that we've seen in other tooling like Azure Data Factory, for example, or within Synapse, we saw the um, support for Azure DevOps and we saw the support for GitHub. But yeah, they've always kind of, so Fabric is now kind of in line with those and kind of brought up to speed if, if you want to be a little bit cruel. But mm -hmm. those other tools never really supported those other options as well. So I, I don't know if that's something that would be on the, the roadmap. Uh, but certainly it would be good to see more options being available. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Anyway, back to the news blog. Enough of all this Git branching uh, malarkey. Uh, what else do you want to look at? So one of the other things I wanted to call out, um, very minor, is the environment uh, resources folder. Um, small point, but it kind of, it, it just kind of stuck with me. Um, this is extending the existing functionality, so you can currently have a notebook and you can have this uh, resources folder that allows you to get, play with like ad hoc data sets and things like that that are related to that notebook. Um, so you've now got the ability to tie that to an environment, um, which is great, kind of shows a bit more separation, but I cannot, I, I'm not a fan of it. I cannot help but feel that this is an isolated pocket of storage. You run the risk of pulling in uh, PII data, which maybe isn't relevant to um, certain areas. You risk isolating that data. It's open for human error as well. Not the way I would work, but I know uh, some people find it quite useful and, and handy. So there's some expansion on that functionality, which is good to see. Uh, the big one that I wanted to call out though, 
Uh, if you jump back, is a couple of points down, and that's Lake House Schemas. So this is still in public preview. Uh, don't get too excited. Um, but essentially, it starts to give us that three-part naming uh, with your tables. So there's a lovely little GIF in there that kind of talks uh, through the capabilities. You create a Lake House that's enabled for Lake House Schemas, and it gives the ability for us to take tables and start to pull them into specific schemas. And then we can secure things against those schemas as well, or we can secure those schemas rather than down to table level. So it starts to build up that security level. Um, we've got the ability to do that kind of three-part naming around lake house schema and table, but there are caveats with this. Um, naming conventions, if you have used any special characters in your workspace, which is bad practice anyway, it's not going to work. Um, right. There's some current problems with the SQL endpoint if you enable this, that it's not currently working, but I imagine this is more just preview bugs that we're working through. Um, but just bear that in mind. Don't jump in uh, feet first or face first uh, into this feature, but it's exciting to see and I'm definitely looking forward to getting that kind of implemented once it goes GA. I am hating the fact that in that little demo GIF, they've called a table customers too. <laughs> it could be customers underscore new or underscore final let's <laughs> <laughs> underscore vinyl v3 yes yeah, yeah. exactly um, cool. so th that's everything for me this uh this route round i wanted us to kind of just hit this quickly hit out the ones that we want that we were most excited about there are other elements in there as always jump into the comments if there's something that you're like you didn't talk about this feature this is the most important one to us let us know. Um, we're always happy to hear about uh, other bits that people are excited about. Um, was there anything else that you were you wanted to touch on? No, that's uh, that covers it for me in terms of the highlights. As I say, try and keep it uh, high level and brief this month. Uh, just sort of pick out those highlights for us, definitely. Great. Uh, so as always, if you're new around here, like and subscribe and keep an eye out for our next news and certainly any of the shorts that we're going to be putting out, talking about some of these features uh, in more depth um, and kind of follow-up videos as well. Um, so yeah, thanks again. See you all next time.